Okay, everybody, um, we are at 12.03, so I wanna get started here. So this format's a little different. We've never had multiple speakers next to me before, so we're gonna try to fit and squeeze everybody in here. There might be some shuffling around because I actually have one other person over there, but we don't have wide angles, so. And then we have Jacob Harriet, the Lincoln County Game Warden, tuning in because there's just no space for all of us on this. So um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Casey Harriet. I'm the R3 coordinator for ODWC and National Wild Turkey Federation. Essentially, I help to create programs, initiatives, and edu educational content that gets people out in the woods hunting and participating in outdoors. So today we're going to be talking about uh, trapping. And it's, this is going to be a brief overview because you really can really dive in. So this will scratch the surface, but we're going to have some opportunities for you guys to learn more. And they're going to be mentioned later. But today our speakers are, we have Colby Farquhar from uh, Sam Boys. He's a biologist for Sam Boys. Um, WMA, we have uh, Jared Davis, who is the fur bear biologist. And then we have J.D. Ridge, who is the senior biologist for uh, UFALA WMA. And then we have Jacob Harriet as well, who's tuning in, like I mentioned before, who will go over laws and regulations. So today we're going to be, I'm going to hand it over to Jared here first, and then we're going to go over a little bit of a presentation. And if you guys have questions, as you guys think of them, type them in the chat box, and we're going to go over, so... Your talk presentations, Jacob's going to go over regulations, and then I will field all those questions at the end. We want to make sure we have plenty of time for those. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, to, okay. to Jared here, and then I'll probably hop back on to try to get share the screen and get the presentation okay. rolling. So, well, Like Casey said, my name is Jared Davis. I'm the fur bear biologist with the Department of Wildlife. And before we uh, start on the presentation and the regulations, I just kind of wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the role of regulated trapping and how important it is uh, as a management tool. So the discipline of trapping is, is guided by scientifically based regulations. And these regulations are strictly enforced both on a statewide level and on a federal level. Um, when, a, when a species can be legally harvested, what traps can be used and the manner in which they can be used, as well as the uh, season limit that each licensed individual is allowed to harvest are all regulated. Uh, even what you can do with the pelt or the carcass of that fur bearing of that fur bearing animal is is also regulated. Um, agencies like the ODWC are continuously reviewing rules, regulations, educational opportunities, uh, even uh, new capture methods to ensure the humaneness of trapping. Uh, countless hours have been spent by state and federal uh, wildlife agencies to develop what we call best management practices or BMPs for trapping. These trapping BMPs provide specific information for each fur bearing species about tools and techniques that are humane, selective, and efficient. The species of wildlife that are trapped are abundant in Oklahoma. Regulated trapping does not cause wildlife to become threatened or endangered. Uh, regulated trapping is used by academic institutions, state and federal wildlife agencies, as well as private organizations to research, relocate, and manage wildlife populations. Our regulations and constant review ensure that populations do not decline unintentionally. Regulated trapping provides many benefits to wildlife and to the people in our state, especially in maintaining a balance between wildlife and the people. Recovery plans for several threatened and endangered species actually involve trapping. In Oklahoma, the reintroduction of the river otter was facilitated by the use of foothold style traps to capture uh, river otter in Louisiana and relocate them into southeastern Oklahoma. Other situations call for tra trapping local predator populations to reduce them to offer relief uh, for ground nesting birds. Regulated trapping also offers relief for human wildlife conflicts such as that, that affect infrastructure. And this would include um, flooding uh, caused by beaver and agricultural damage, uh, either through crop, or lo crop loss or uh, livestock depredation. So I just briefly touched on how regulated trapping has been and is still being used as a management tool and, and kind of how we develop those, those rules and regulations. Um, but just to reiterate some of those key messages, you know, modern trapping is guided by scientifically based regulations and strictly enforced. Um, wildlife agencies are continuously reviewing and developing rules and regulations that consider animal welfare. The species that are being trapped are abundant 
and does not cause wildlife to become threatened or endangered. Uh, regulated trapping can provide many benefits to both wildlife populations and to humans. Our goal as an agency is to maintain the use of regulated trapping as a safe, efficient, and humane means of managing and harvesting these wild, this wildlife population for the benefits it provides while ensuring the welfare of the animal. So that's kind of my uh, take on, on this. And now I think we're going to I pass it on to you. Or Yeah, I'm going okay. to end up sharing my screen here okay. real fast. And once again, just a reminder, if you guys have questions as we go through all this, just type them in the chat box and we will field them all at the end. Even if we go over an hour, we want to make sure that we get everybody's questions answered. Um, okay, give me a second here. This has always been kind of difficult to share. Not mine. So the hard part is this hides it and I have to get up. <laughs> Can you see what I'm doing? I'm trying to get to the tab there. Okay. You <laughs> see, that bar always has hit it. Okay. And the slide should go. Let's go on here. Get us down small. And let me know when this pops up if you guys can see it. It's just black at the moment, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know how this works. Okay. Okay. Can you guys see that? Anybody? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Thank you, Jacob. Okay. I'm going to turn this up. So, all right. I'm going to hand it over to you guys now, and you guys can. Right. So, this is a, a very basic presentation that I put together. I just wanted to go over a little bit of equipment. Uh, a couple of fairly common sets for land trappers, just really, really simple stuff. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to cover it. Uh, there's just so much that goes into this that it's really hard to narrow it down to just a, a few minutes of a presentation. But with that, here's a list of the legal fur bearers in Oklahoma. Uh, the main ones that we're going to focus on in regards to this are going to be these three right here, coyotes, bobcats, and raccoons, uh, they're prevalent, they're, I mean, they're statewide. Uh, so I'm gonna just jump into some of the tools of the trade. That's kind of a big thing. You know, it does take a, a few different kinds of tools to do much land trapping, especially when you start getting into the coyotes and bobcats, foxes, things like that. It's a little bit more equipment intensive um, the main things that are used though, you're going to need a hammer of some kind. Uh, you see the hammer there, it's got a, a digging edge on it so that you can dig the, the trap beds. And I'll kind of show a picture of some of that here in a minute. Uh, you're going to need, uh, some kind of anchors. I typically use the earth anchor there, the cable attached to that little piece of metal. And then the earth anchor driver on the far right of this picture, I uh, typically use those. They're a little bit lighter weight, easier to carry easier to deal with, and I think they hold better than rebar stakes. Uh, with rebar, they work, but you've got to have a special swivel, and really you need to be double staking. Uh, it's just a little more weight, a little bit, bit more to carry. Uh, you see a sifter there. When you go to bed your foothold traps, you need to be able to place the dirt back over the trap and make sure you don't have rocks or anything like that in there that could impede the closure of the jaws. That's all the way down. Which direction? Hey, we got to have you guys muted. We can hear you. And I can't mute you now since we're presenting. Thank you, Casey. Uh, and the other thing in the picture there is a picture of a dog proof trap. I've got uh, a little bit of a video here in a bit about how to set those. Some of the other tools that we use, uh, some people use a trowel in regards to making like a dirt hole set, which I've got a picture of in a minute. Uh, you see a foothold trap there. Uh, that's a pretty typical coil spring trap. There are different sizes of coil spring traps and, and also long spring traps. And you would determine the size of the trap that you would use based on the animal. And you can uh, follow the best management practices that Jared mentioned earlier for that. Uh, that foothold trap's actually hooked up to a, uh, a spring there that creates a little bit of a cushion uh, for the animal when it's, you know, moving against the trap. 
uh, and then a bunch of chain and a drag so that it can actually uh, get away from, you know, it can pull that a little bit of a ways from, you know, if you're trapping a, an area that you don't want a big trap circle right there. Uh, it's just, it also works really well where you can't stake traps in the ground because it's too rocky or hard. Huh? Big lady is down here now. No, I'm not all right. Please, please mute, mute yourselves, please. Uh, yeah. And then on the far right, we've got a stake puller. Uh, you use those, especially for the earth anchors. They really hold well. Uh, I've used everything from a homemade thing to a high lift jack, but a dedicated stake puller is really worth the investment. And there's there's more tools, but this is, if you had nothing but some of this, you could absolutely be trapping and be successful. Uh, I don't use a trowel and some of this stuff, but uh, it's just kind of a, a good list of things to have. Uh, trap terminology. This is a, a decent little picture of a single coil spring trap. It kind of gives you an idea of what I'll be talking about in relation to how to set a trap, you know, compressing levers, uh, what the dog is, jaws, all that kind of stuff. I've got a short video here of setting a foothold trap. Can you guys hear that? I might have to go into sharing. Well, we have we have no audio if you want to just narrate it, Colby. Okay. I I'm going to go back. We were afraid of that. <laughs> Might expand it out, too. Is, we're showing a foothold, how to set a foothold. And there's, obviously, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, I like to do it the way it's illustrated here across my thigh or knee. And once you get the the uh, springs depressed and get your hand over the jaws, it's not that hard to hold the trap. Then as you can see, pull the dog over, hook it on the, the pan. Wow, that got big. No. <laughs> and then uh, what I'm doing there is setting what's called the night latch, which is some more terminology for the way the the dog and the pan interact. But um, it's a pretty simple procedure once you've done a couple of them. It's not uh, as intimidating as it might appear. And if you look off my right knee in that picture there, those red, those are trap setting tools that, they actually hook on the springs, on the levers, on the spring levers, and make depressing the levers very easy. However, for me, they make the actual holding the jaws down and getting to the dog and pan a little more difficult. So it's it's a, you know, a, as you gain more experience, uh, you'll get more comfortable with that and you'll find the way that works best for you. Um, all right and then i've also got a short video here of uh, setting a, a dog proof trap these are pretty simple let me get it back here all right hopefully this is jd your uh videography was a little bad so it's basically the same <laughs> thing right. You compress the spring, uh, you pull the dog over and set it in the notch. Uh, it can be pretty difficult. The springs on these are pretty tight. And so you can use something like a screwdriver, uh, get it in there. That gives you a quite a bit more leverage. And then you can see I pulled the dog over the spring and uh, set it into that notch. These things are great for coon trapping. They're easy to, to put out a bunch of them. They're really effective. And the nice thing about these is that they're very selective. 
uh, really other than raccoons or a possum, maybe a rare skunk, uh, you really don't catch much else in them. So there, if you're in an area where you've got a lot of coons and you don't want any kind of non-target, you know, as far as catching a coyote or a fox or whatever, that's probably the way to go. These are also called um, enclosed trigger trap. You'll see that in the literature sometimes. It's kind of an all-inclusive term for the quote-unquote dog proof. And then I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of a couple of the really common sets that are used for predator trapping. So more of your coyote, fox, bobcat trapping. Uh, one that I use a lot is called a flat set. And this picture on the left, I've got the little tuft of grass kind of as a backing. Uh, that's just kind of keeping the animal from coming that direction maybe. Uh, I dug a small hole, not any bigger really than the, the trap size itself, and then a hole in the middle to put the chain and stuff in. The photos I took of that didn't really come out, but you can see the trap bedded in the ground there. And uh, getting that trap really stable is going to be important regardless what set you use. You want that trap where if an animal stepped on the jaws or the, the levers, that it's not going to wiggle any at all. But once I've got the trap bedded, uh, I can take uh, take that sifter and I cover it up like you see in the middle picture. Uh, me personally, I like to uncover the pan and then I'll cover the whole uh, little trap circle there. And then like you see on the picture on the far right, I uh, cover just the pan with clean dirt. To me, what that does is it gives an animal a really definite area to step that there's no noise or anything. If you've ever seen a cat or a dog trying to stalk a squirrel in the yard, uh, you know, they're really cautious with where they put their feet. They don't want to make noise or anything. Well, giving them a spot there free of any leaves or anything like that. I want the whole trap bed bedded in and covered and concealed really well, but I want that spot to stand out to them as a good place to put their foot. Another set that's really common usage, uh, maybe even more so than a flat set, is what's called a dirt hole. And I've just got a single picture of that, but... Uh, what you've got here is a dirt hole and then the trap is bedded just below that hole in the picture here. Uh, the, the dirt hole is kind of set into an embankment. There's a big rock there on top of it. That's to kind of keep it from being dug up from behind, force the animal to come and look at it from the position of where the trap's at. And typically there's gonna be bait or lure uh, either put in the hole or under the rock, uh, but that's a really kind of a eye catching set where the flat set is a bit more subtle and subdued and you're relying more on uh, the animal either just walking down a trail or you're relying more on the, the scent appeal that you've associated with it and uh, we can talk about you know scents and lures and all of that stuff here in a little bit uh, and one last thing i wanted to to say on this is uh if you have some more interest in this be on the lookout we do have three upcoming ODWC hosted in-person trapping workshops that'll be happening in late January and early February. Uh, there's gonna be one at James Collins Wildlife Management Area, one at Hula Wildlife Management Area, and one at Pack Saddle Wildlife Management Area. And uh, be on the lookout for the information that'll be coming out on that in uh, the next couple of weeks. And with that, if you've got any questions, uh, we're happy to answer anything here. Uh, I would really like to, you know, have some good Q&A going back and forth. Here's mine and JD's contact information. We're always happy to uh, talk trapping and, and help people out. So that's all I've got as far as the presentation goes. And I will give it, people a second to screenshot that if they're on their phones or take a picture of it. Um, if you guys are on your laptops, make sure you have those contact information. And I can also send them out in a follow-up email where I will record this. Or once I send download the recording and edit the front and the back, I will send this out to all the participants here. So. And also, uh, Colby and I and Jared probably too are all listed in the the annual hunting guide. So, yes. and like and like like was said, we're always happy to take phone calls and answer questions on this stuff we enjoy we enjoy doing it we enjoy teaching what we know about it and we enjoy answering questions so don't be afraid to give us a call okay so now um, i'm going to have jacob harriet lincoln county game warden give a brief overview of some of the regulations and what he sees out in the field uh, and then we will start fielding questions and have a good q a at the end 
All right, guys, like you said, I'm Jacob. Uh, so trapping regulations seem a little more complicated than just your general hunting regs, but don't let it scare you off. There's just kind of some measurements, some technical terms in it. It's not super hard. I don't have many problems with trappers. Usually my trappers are a pretty good group of guys, and uh, they, they know what they're doing. They take care of it. If you guys are getting into it, it can look a little intimidating, but don't let that stop you. It's, it's not that hard, I promise. So right out of the regs, I'm going to go through. This is all information you all can get online or through the book. I'll touch on this stuff, and then I kind of will show some stuff I see in the field. So license requirements, if you're a resident, all you need uh, – for trapping, you have to have your hunting license, your fur license, and then a trapping license. If you have your lifetime license, you don't need it. You're completely covered by all that. Uh, sorry, I was trying to – had a question pop up. I'll get it at the end. Uh, Non-residents, you'll need your hunting license and a non-resident fur license. So your season dates and bag limits. So beavers, uh, raccoons, striped skunks, and uh, coyotes are open year-round. So that's – one thing to think about is trapping season normally runs from January 1st to the end of February, but those species you can trap year round. So don't let that stop you. If you know you're busy that time of year or whatever, you can uh, do it other times of the year. But just remember, if you are to catch a fur bearer like a, a bobcat or a fox, you're going to have to have a method to let those things go. Uh, so there's no season limit for or your possession limit or season limit on your uh, skunks, raccoons, beavers, striped skunks. For bobcats, uh, your daily limit, there is not one, and there's a 20 bobcat possession limit, uh, and that season goes from the 1st of December to the end of February. Gray fox, the daily combined limit is two with no more than one red fox. The season combined limit is six with no more than two red fox. Uh, river otter, there's no bat or daily limit, but your season limit is six. And badger, mink, muskrat, uh, possum, and weasels, there's no limit. We do have a few fur bearers that are protected. If you're not supposed to harvest a uh, swift fox and spotted skunk and ring tailed cats, I've never really had an issue with people running across those. Uh, if you do, you know, you're feel free to call your warden. And if you're not sure, a lot of people probably wouldn't even know what they were. So if you catch something, you're not sure what they are, uh, you can give us a call. We can give you some uh, help with that. Like I said, coyotes statewide, there's no, no limit on them at all. Uh, so your legal traps. So th there are some measurements with your traps. So, like uh, Kobe showed in the things, those coil spring traps, uh, they actually have springs in them. The single ones don't have to be offset. The If they have two springs in it, they do have to be offset at least an eighth of an inch. And those traps can't be bigger than eight inches uh, from the outside length of the trap. So basically an eight inch circle, it can't be bigger than that. And if it has two springs, it needs an offset. An offset is imagine if, if the jaws were shut, there is just a gap in between those good jaws that it's just kind of a, almost like a little cushion, a little relief area to hold that animal. These traps do not chop the foot off the animal. They don't cause the animal lots of damage. All the traps do is hold it until you can get there and safely put it down. Uh, I get that a lot. People think that, you know, there's a bear trap and they're chopping the legs off animals. That's not what they do. The, the traps that we use and regulate, all they do is hold them and they do not do a harm to the animal. And we want that. We don't want to cause the animal a lot of pain. Uh, so box traps are completely legal. Uh, colony traps, if you're doing, uh, you know, like muskrat sets and stuff like that. Uh, so setting your traps, you're not supposed to set your traps in any uh, paths, roadways, uh, runways commonly used for recreational purposes uh, by persons, dogs, or other domestic animals. So just be respectful of that. Uh, if you think somebody's going to be walking and step on your trap, don't do it. That trap's not going to hurt them at all with the cool springs, but it might give them a startle and it might spook them a little bit. Uh, visiting traps. This is a big one I run into. So you have to check your traps every 24 hours. Us as trappers, we want to set a good example. We do not want that animal to be in that trap longer than 24 hours. So just check them once a day. Uh, it's not that hard. If you're working, you can check them after work. Just every 24 hours, you need to check those traps. The legal number of traps. So resident trappers under the general uh, annual resident trapping license, you can have 20 or no more than 20 traps. If you have a lifetime license, there's no restrictions on your traps at all. Uh, or uh, the number of traps that you have. Uh, identification on traps. Uh, you need to have your customer ID number on there uh, if you're on any sort of public property or anything like that. If you're on private property uh, that you own or lease, you do not have to have them marked. But other than that, just uh, they make little copper tags that you can put your number in. They're, they're very reasonable. They're not expensive. Uh, you have to replace them from time to time, but they're not that bad. Uh, posting traps. Uh, public land, you have to put your trap postings on any of entrances off roads or highways. 
Uh, if you're on private property, you do not have to post traps anymore unless that landowner would like you to. Uh, just be respectful of the landowner's wishes. Uh, if you're posting traps, your signs have to be a certain measurement. Uh, it has to say traps must be uh, eight inches wording. So trap word has to be eight inches long and two inches tall and just has to be you know displayed visibly. Uh, not rocket scientists or rocket science. I've never had any issues with that. Uh, permission to trap. So no person may trap on inhabited land of another without first obtaining the owner's and occupant's permission to do so. So just like anything else, you got to have permission where you're going. Hunter warns requirements, it, it would be the same. You know, if it's a big game gun season, be respectful of that. Make sure you're wearing your orange. Uh, so there are two species that we have to tag, your river otters and bobcats. Uh, so if you trap anything uh, in that category, bobcats, river otters, make sure you get them tagged. You have 10 days to tag them after the close of the season. So after February 29th, you have 10 working days to get those tagged. Game wardens, I tag a ton of them every year. So just call me. Give me a little bit of a heads up. Uh, I like to do them all at once. So don't call me at the beginning of the season and be like, hey, I caught a bobcat. Well, if you're going to keep tracking, trapping, just go ahead and save them all up. I'll come at the end of year and do that. Same with your otters. Just try to do them all at once. It saves, you know, it just saves me time not having to make multiple trips. Um, when you trap something that is a bobcat or an otter, the way those tags work, it's just a plastic tag. It goes in the mouth and out the eye socket. So if you will, before you freeze them, if you're freezing them whole, just cut a slit in that uh, underneath the skin, it won't damage the hide, but cut a slit in there and put a toothpick or some sort of piece of wood or something so I can come and get that tag in there. I, it happens every year, but people will want to get a bobcat or an otter mounted and I have to tag those. To, so to tag those, I have to physically put that tag through there. I can't give it to you and have you do it when it falls out. So I don't want to damage your hide. So if you cut that slit in there, that'll let me do that a lot easier. I won't have to damage any, any hides. Uh, so selling a furs, it's completely legal to sell your furs. Uh, you have to sell them to a licensed fur dealer if they're green. Uh, it's a really fun time. If you guys have never done it before, the fur auctions, uh, it's, it's an awesome experience. You get to meet some really cool people that are very knowledgeable on it. Uh, I recommend going to a fur auction if you're selling it. Even if you don't want to sell it and you just want to learn about trapping, it's a great place to uh, go learn about trapping. The possession of carcasses and hides. So you can have all the, uh, the legal stuff if you're holding over. Uh, bobcats and otters, you have to fill out a form and submit it to the department. I believe it's a 10-day, 10-day, uh, I believe. You have 10 days after the close of the season to submit it, and then you just submit that form, and then it's a holdover permit. I never had any issues with that either. So tagging hands, like I said, put that slit through the eye for the otters and the bobcats. The reason we have that is there is an endangered species of bobcat, and there is an endangered species of otter. We don't want to get those con confused and get those sold on the black market so we want to make sure that those bobcats are coming from oklahoma they're tagged legally in oklahoma and in good shape there uh just some things that i run into a lot in the field that's basically all the regs in the reg book but so snares are, are not legal for trapping there it is not a legal method of trapping in oklahoma you can't use them uh, on on land sets at all uh conna bears are bought or the uh Oh, conner bears are body grip traps. You can use those underwater, but they have to be completely submerged. Uh, so I get calls every single year. Somebody saying, hey, my dog just came running in here with a uh, snare on it. That's illegal. It, it looks bad on the trappers. Just like, you know, hunters, us as trappers, we're setting the example of what people see trappers are. Trapping is, is very much the minority of people in Oklahoma, for sure. So if one person has a bad experience with somebody that is trapping, then that's going to be their perspective for the rest of their life. So make sure you do a good job. Take care of the animals. Don't let them sit out there. Uh, try your best not to catch dogs. Uh, in Oklahoma, I promise you, if you're trapping, you'll probably end up catching a dog. Have a game plan on how to let that thing go. Uh, do your best to let it go. And in my county, it depends on your DA's office. It is the landowner's responsibility to keep their animals on their property. So if I'm trapping on my property and I catch a dog, that landowner can get issued a citation for that because they don't keep their animals on their property. Uh, but with that being said, you know, respect your neighbors, try to, you know, talk to them, try not to injure their dogs. Like I said, the traps don't hurt the animals, they just hold them. So you should be able to let that thing go and be fine, but don't get bit trying to do that. Uh, the snare thing is common. Every year I get hundreds of calls on people with snares on their dogs. They're not legal. Do not set snares uh, on land. But that's about it. Make sure you got permission where you're going. Uh these guys are very knowledgeable on trapping, so if I missed anything, I'm sure they can help me cover it.
Uh, but other than that, I think that's all I got. Thank you. That was super thorough, Jacob. Um, okay, so I think now, I think we want to start fielding questions, but since we have so many, I'm kind of, how do you want to do that, Jared? You've been just go back and read the read basically what uh, what was what was written, and then either talk it to somebody or, or answer it. Um, okay, I can see him the, too. Which is the first? What's the first one you have? Um, so I kind of answered this one in the chat, but it says if you have a lifetime hunting license, do you need any other license? So as a lifetime license holder, you don't need any additional licenses. Um, Hear us, by the way. Yeah. He's down the. Okay, good. Um, the only additional thing that you'd need to do, like Jacob said, for the for the bobcat and the river otter, they are required to be uh, physically tagged with a CITES tag, um, which you can get from your local game warden, uh, or uh, we do have private tagging stations that, that are up on our website. In regards to that, uh, Jacob mentioned that there are species that are endangered. We actually don't have those here. Uh, the Mexican bobcat and the uh, sea otter are the ones that are the lookalikes, but it is a national uh, federal law that all bobcats and all otters will be tagged just so that we know where they came from and know that they're not coming from there. So if you catch a bobcat or an otter in Oklahoma, you don't have to worry that it's one of the endangered species. Good point. Yeah. Um, so the next question was, are there any differences in the regulations in a rural or an urban setting? Jacob, you want to take that one? So those are the statewide regulations. If there is some sort of city ordinance where you live in an urban area, I mean, you have to abide by those city ordinances. As far as what I'm enforcing, I enforce the state law on this. Uh, that being said, be smart. You know, don't be setting traps. If you live in a, a very small addition where the houses are all around, you know, don't set traps right on your fence line where your animal or your neighbors are going to see those animals you know, flopping around in the trap because those animals, when you catch them, you know, it, imagine walking around and something hitting your foot. They're going to bounce around. They're going to raise, or, you know, raise some commotion just so they figure out what's going on. Then they usually calm down. But, uh, you know, just be respectful and, and don't paint uh, trappers in a bad light. If somebody is a neighbor that is not in the hunting or trapping community and they just go out there and it looks like you got a bunch of raccoons chained up all around your place, it's, it's going to look bad. So just be cautious of that. But legal wise, no. Uh, those regulations that I read, that's the same in, in urban and uh, rural environments. We have a question. Um, do you all know how many people in Oklahoma trap? So and it's kind of hard to uh, it's kind of hard to get a, a, a good number on that because lifetime license holders are, are included in those trapping numbers as far as the license go. Um, but as as far as the annual trapping license that we sell, we sell about 1300 annual trapping license every year. And then we have, like I said, every everybody in Oklahoma that has a lifetime license uh, is allowed to trap. So we, I mean, there's probably about two thousand active trappers in Oklahoma on any in any given year. It's the smallest of all of our our pop, hunter populations, I would say. Mm -hmm. Falconry. Falconry. <laughs> well, falconry would be, yeah, that would be the smallest of it. Yeah, you're tr that's true here. Yeah. Um, Okay, so the next one was, do all sporting goods stores sell the traps needed in Oklahoma? Um, so Bass Pro, Cabela's, they will sell some of your some of your traps. They'll also sell, sell snares and body grips. So be so be careful. I said body grips are allowed, like Jacob said, but they're they're only allowed in underwater or submerged sets on private land. So be careful with your body gripping traps. Um, no snares, no. no cable restraints. That was another thing I was going to say. Just because you can buy it at Atwoods does not mean it's legal. Yeah, uh, I get that all the time. People, I'll catch people, you know, say, "Well, I bought it at Atwoods. I figured it was legal." That does not mean it's legal. Like I said, the snares and those body grip traps are not not legal on land use at all. Yeah. So just be careful. But there are places uh, online like uh, Minnesota Brand, uh, Duke. Uh, we have a couple of suppliers in Oklahoma. Okie Cable Trap Supply. Um, Bitter Creek Fur Company. Uh, there's there's a couple of others I can't think off the top of my head, but um, you know, so you can buy those traps online as well. The next question was talking asking about snare sets if they're permissible 
in Oklahoma. We've already covered that. They're not. Are they effective? You know what? Yeah. Like oh hey, mute like yourself. <laughs> some some people parents. Let me tell you. That would be my mother tuning in from headquarters. <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> That is real funny. Somebody had asked about uh, ground nesting birds, and we had, we had mentioned that, or I had mentioned that in the beginning. And there, we we're actually conducting some research in Oklahoma right now to look at the effectiveness. Okay. Um, I was just thinking, I don't really have crap relief. <laughs> Kelly, please shut up. <laughs> what? Do not speak to your mother in law like that. Be, be quiet. Yourself. We can hear you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, but there, so there's some preliminary yeah, evidence that uh, the trapping or local localized populations of, of ground nesting predators um, will have an effect on nesting success. But we're still we're still going through that right now. Um, if you're a landowner, what license do you need? Uh, the only license that you would need if you're not a lifetime license holder is the special fur license, which that that is required if you are trapping um, bobcat, river otter, raccoon, or any of the fox species. So um, that is that does not your the landowner exemption does not cover a special fur license. Um, Jacob, this one's going to be for you as well. Uh, they were asking, can you trap up until midnight on the last day of as long as you pull your traps at midnight? It runs to the last day of February, so I would say yes, that's fine with me. Okay. And then uh, what do you do if you accidentally trap more than the limit on Red Fox? Um, that's, you know, like Jacob was saying, these these traps are designed to restrain or hold an animal. They're not designed to to injure an animal. So at that point in time, if you if you're on your limit of red fox, uh, you just find the best way to release it. You know, catch pole. Uh, they make some shields with notches in them that you can you can uh, work around their foot or just put a tote over them with a hole cut in it. That's that's mine because I like to it, sit down. I'm lazy. It's best to have help on a release, <laughs> but it can be done. I've done it. I've released non-targets by myself. It's not fun, but it's doable and like they've said, very little damage to the foot. You hardly ever see it. We, um, we've said that several times. Uh, anybody who's run foothold traps for any length of time has caught themselves. I catch myself probably multiple times a year, and it's not breaking bones. It's not breaking skin. It's not really even bruising me. It's just holding me there. I pull myself out, and I go on about my life. Um, so they, they really are just designed to hold. There's a lot of misinformation out there about, you know, what they're designed to do, break bones and stuff. That's not the purpose of these. Um, and so that, that really is something I want to, you know, make clear that they're not, they're not designed for that. The next one was, uh, can you put your name on the copper tags? Uh, and I believe it's, Jacob, it is name or customer ID. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Yes. All right. And you can get trap tags that have nothing on them and you just write whatever it is you want on it with just a pen or anything that creates an impression, or you can get actual copper tags that have that information stamped in there. Uh, pretty much any trapping supply can, can get you either one. Uh, but you do, or you could even take a, an engraver or stamps and put that into the base plate of your traps themselves you know, anything like that, as long as that information is there. And they're dirt cheap when you buy them too. So it's not going to, it's not going to break the bank or, you know, pennies on the dollar normally. As a follow up on that real quick, somebody just asked, what's a customer ID number on your uh, go outdoors, Oklahoma profile. You have a customer ID number. That's basically your profile of that has all of your license information in it. So if you look at your go outdoors, Oklahoma profile, you'll have your customer ID on it. Um, there was a question about, I have neighbor's dogs and deer and hogs in the same area as raccoons. Will the dog proof trap keep the other animals from getting hurt? And if someone dogs, someone's dog does get hurt in a trap, am I responsible for hurting the dog? Which Jacob covered that in Oklahoma, or at least in Lincoln County. Um, you know, it's, it's your, 
uh, your responsibility to keep your animals on your own property. So you would not get in trouble if there was a dog on your property um, that got trapped. As far as uh, deer and hog, you know, these traps are designed to, to catch the, the foot of, a, of an animal uh, in between the, the toe pad and the heel pad. So an animal that's got a hoof like a deer or a hog, they're going to just pull out of these styles of traps. So you're not going to hurt them. But especially the dog proof traps, you're not going to get any off catch of I've never heard of anybody catching a canine, maybe a fox, fox maybe pretty rare. Yeah. So especially no no deer or hogs um, or or domestic dogs, I wouldn't I would imagine. So I've you'd be safe. Dog, I'm sure so th those those dog proof traps or enclosed trigger traps. They've only got a, a hole to reach into that's maybe an inch and a quarter or something. And the animal to actually trigger it has to, to stick a hand or a paw down in there and actually manipulate a trigger. And so animals like raccoons are, you know, really good at doing something like that. Uh, but even a, a small dog, you know, it's just, it's not going to, not going to happen. It, it would be in a, a very far out there anomaly. So the next question is, so if the fur is tanned, do you still have to sell it to a fur dealer or can you mm -hmm. sell it to anyone? Once uh, once a fur is tanned, it's considered a garment product and there is no additional licensing that is required. So you can you can sell that. Anybody at that point can buy that buy that fur. Um, and then uh, what do you use that works well to lure in coyotes? So that is a very big discussion and every single trapper is going to tell you something wildly different, most likely. Uh, when you're talking about scent-based lures, you've got baits, which are generally meat-based, uh, bobcat meat, beaver meat. They can be a little smelly, uh, you know, kind of rotten, but that's going to be your baits. And then you have urines. Uh, most people use either coyote, uh, red fox or bobcat and then you've got lures and so you've got curiosity lures like I use one on occasion that's basically like a liquid smoke uh, but then a lot of gland lures they'll have coyote glands ground up in there with who knows what concoction I mean there's probably thousands of lure makers out there and everybody does it differently um, typically when I'm trapping I've always got a urine uh, curiosity and a gland-based lure. I don't always use them uh, on the set. Sometimes I use one, sometimes I use a combination of all. It really just depends on how I feel that day. Honestly, I don't know that I've seen one be any more successful than the other. Uh, I do use something called a, a call lure a lot. It's often a gland lure that has a really skunky aspect to it. They, they actually, fur buyers will buy the skunk essence or stink for a lack of a better term for it. Uh, and they will add that into their lures. That really kind of has a reach out there and grab you uh, scent attractant quality. But as far as specifics, I, I really don't know if you can go wrong. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there and they all work. There are some trappers who swear by a certain brand or a certain lure, but I've not seen where you know, there's really just one that doesn't work and one that just catches everything. They, they're all pretty successful. If you, if you uh, combine them with traps that are placed in a good location, you know, with some sign and uh, you've got the traps bedded well, you know, you're going to be successful. All right, uh, Jacob, this one's going to be for you because who doesn't like one that uh, might stump you? What would be required of a trapper to trap right of ways on county roads? You would have to get permission from your county, the whoever maintains that roadway. In my experience, I have not not had anybody ever do that legally. I've had a lot of people do it illegally and get in trouble <laughs> for it. But uh, so, sometimes, you know, uh, like say, for example, you could go underneath the county road bridge if you had permission from that county or from the private landowner. Most in my county, at least, and I think most counties are like this, they will let you fish underneath the county easements and stuff, but they won't let you hunt or trap but you can use that to access private land with permission. All right, and uh, do gun and archery qualify as legal means of take when it comes to fur bearers during their respective season? For instance, a deer hunter taking advantage of an opportunity while sitting in a deer stand. Uh, absolutely. 
as yeah. long as as long as you uh, have a required license. Yeah. It, yeah. One thing to think of that gets people on that is if you're shooting raccoons, you have to have that fur license. Uh, they're, they're a fur bearing animal. So a lot of times if you just have, you know, your annual hunting and your annual or your you know deer gun license, uh, if you shoot a raccoon or a bobcat, you have to have that fur license as well. We're caught up on 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 uh, questions from the yeah, I'm, chat feed. Has anybody asked a question that hasn't been addressed, whether it was maybe accidentally direct message to me? I'm looking trying to make sure everything I, I did one. Yeah, um, go ahead. Do you guys mind me asking it over the phone like this? No, this oh, is fine. Okay. Um, so how do you guys uh figure out a population of a very elusive animal like a bobcat and their population densities and stuff like that? Oh, I like that. That's a good question. Okay, so um bobcat is is actually a really good uh example of this. So we have the bobcats required to be tagged. So we have CITES tags for those bobcats, which give us a location and it also gives us the gender. Um, so we get a, with that, we know we're not a hundred percent, but we're probably about 95% as far as how many are taken in, off the landscape and where they're taken from. Um, then we can get their, their sex ratios and we can actually see from long-term trends um, with the, the male to female ratios that the population is is staying stable versus um, when you start seeing skewed ratios, like super high male to female ratios, ours are actually a little bit higher on the male side, 55 to 56% male. Uh, and it's been that way for 15 years. So we've had a very stable uh, ratio trend of, of male to female, as well as harvest trends. But we do have uh, additional um, surveys that we conduct. We do a roadside sighting survey in March. And also Oklahoma State University has done some uh, bobcat research for us here recently, um, pulling together some undergrad uh, work that has kind of spanned the state as well as three uh, site specific areas of, of uh, research on our WMAs. So we actually did some work at Pack Saddle and James Collins and Sandy Sanders. So, just based off of off of uh, where we catch them from, how many we're catching on a yearly basis, and and putting that together with our surveys that we conduct, and and looking at long term trend lines, long term harvest lines, uh, you know, we're we're we feel it's very safe to say that that population is is actually stable to increasing in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I can agree with that. I think I have too many on my property. Um, I trapped two years ago, and um, I heard you said something about a ground bird study. Yeah. Um, so I trapped 10 acres, and it was just around my chickens because I had a, a bobcat that was coming in and stealing stuff when my livestock guard dogs would chase off coyotes. Um, so I trapped 10 acres two years ago caught four bobcats uh i know i still have one that i missed um and multiple coyotes and coons and stuff in my quail population actually i didn't know i had quail and then they came back and then my turkey numbers of course went up as well mm -hmm. uh, but it looks like i affected about a thousand acres around me just by doing that 10 acres yeah. Uh, and that, so that's part of the part of the study that or an aspect of the study that we're going to be adding in is looking at how um, how effort in an in an area affects the surrounding areas. And mm -hmm. if, if uh, an area is trapped intensively next to another area that's trapped intensively, of course, that's going to make an impact. But if it's just localized in an area that nobody else is trapping and what kind of effect does that does that have uh, when it comes to ground nesting bird uh, success? Um, so yeah, it's that's very very awesome that, that you're able to see that effect. Okay, um, we got another no. question. Oh, sorry. Can we get? We'll have to get to these other questions. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, where and when are those fur bear sales? That was something Jacob mentioned earlier. 
Yeah, so there's there's one auction currently in the state, and it is um, the second weekend of March at the Oak Mulgee County Fairgrounds uh, in Oak Mulgee. That's hosted by the Oklahoma Fur Bears Association or Oklahoma Fur Bears Alliance, OFBA. Um, you can find them on Facebook, and um, you know you can follow their posts there. Uh, and then, of course, there are international auction houses that you can become members of and ship to, or you can sell to um, local fur dealers or in-state fur dealers, which we'll have a list of those on our website as well. Best way to dispatch a skunk in a foothold without getting pursued. <laughs> <laughs> nice way of putting it. I think he wants you to answer that one, Colby. <laughs> so, uh, the the best way that I'm aware of, uh, it actually involves a, a kind of a specialized tool. It's it's basically a syringe pole, um, and you inject acetone into the lungs. Uh, it really they they go unconscious almost immediately, and they very rarely spray. The downfall of it is you do have to get within six or eight feet of them, so you've got to be careful with that. Uh, you can also take like a 22 CB or something like that that's low impact velocity and uh, shoot them, you know, behind the shoulder where you would shoot a deer or anything else. And uh, oftentimes they won't spray when you do that as well. Beyond those two methods, uh, good luck. <laughs> I've had really good luck with uh, those like kind of nicer quality pellet guns and just mm -hmm. shooting behind the shoulder like that seems to work pretty well. Yeah, it's yeah. about 50, 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you can, if you can get them uh, dispatched without spraying, um, they're actually one of the more money making fur bearers these days because you can take a syringe and you can actually remove what they would spray, uh, put that in a glass jar and it's, the last I was hearing was somewhere between 10 to $20 an ounce, depending on where you were selling it. Uh, so, you know, you can make quite a bit of money off skunks because uh, a nice adult skunk, uh, you can you can get an ounce out of one pretty easy. And unfortunately, these days, not a lot of fur bears are bringing $15, $20 for a pelt, but you can get that. I mean, pretty much every year you can sell uh, skunk essence for that price. And I'll, I'm going to jump in here real quick. That brings up another point that we hadn't really touched on is secondary markets. You know, everybody thinks about the fur being the valuable part, and that's not necessarily the case. In some cases, uh, the meat can have value. Like with bobcats, a lot of the bait base lure or the bait base meat is bobcat meat. And so sometimes you can sell your the meat off your bobcat carcasses um skulls have a value um uh what else uh Skull beaver claw, casters uh, bobcat claws some there there are secondary markets if a person you know seeks those out sometimes you can get multiple things from one like a beaver for instance you can sell the hide you can sell the caster you can sell the skull and in some cases the meat just for starters and in some cases the tail has value for for uh, beavers and some of these other critters so you know just be aware that there are other markets available and if you do a little looking around you might be able to maximize your returns Nick, why don't you tell them about the beaver broths you made us one time <laughs> he said so good he's muted but so um like colby was talking about so last year at the uh, at the state in-state auction, um, skunk pelts averaged eight dollars and fifty cents per pelt, uh, and essence averaged fifteen dollars and sixty-two cents an ounce. So you were saying you get about how much off of one adult skunk? I've an ounce. A full a full ounce. So you're looking at twenty-three dollars for a for a skunk. Please. Okay. Um, <laughs> My mom tried those beaver broths so too. She didn't like them. <laughs> we've got a, a couple other questions here. Uh, looks like 
go back up here. How long does intensive trapping in an area impact local populations of coyotes or raccoons? Seems like when I do intensive trapping, the population rebounds within two years or less. Is this from creating a population migrating in or change in reproduction? Uh, both. You know, yeah. Just... So anytime that you create a vacuum like that, you're going to have you're going to have migration or integration from outside populations, as well as um, with coyotes. There is uh, there is evidence of them having increased reproduction during during uh, increased um, mortality uh, events. So there you're also going to you're going to have an increase in the in the localized population as far as reproduction goes, but then you'll also create a vacuum which will pull in um, coyotes into into it from an other range, other ranges into into your local range. But yeah, it is going to it is going to have it's going to be an up and down. You're going to have to continue to do it. It's nothing. It's not a one and done. That's for sure. And, you, and you're going to have some natural variation in these populations as well. But I think the take home from that discussion is if you are going to undertake some uh, predator control on your property, it's got to be an ongoing thing. It's not a it's not a one and done endeavor. It's something that would have to be continued mm -hmm. yep. to see a continued benefit from it. Uh, next question is, can snares be used for dispatch? I'll let you handle that one, Jacob. Uh, I mean, you could do that. I would not recommend it, but yeah, that is an option. They have some dispatch poles. It is basically like a ratcheted snare uh, that work pretty good. But as far as just trying to loop a snare around an animal to dispatch it, I, I would not recommend that. You, usually what I would use is I just have a, a 22 pistol. And, you know, you can humanely put them down pretty quick with a headshot. Uh, those skunks, you know, shoot them behind the shoulder. But that seems to work well. Uh, I feel like you might be in for a rodeo trying to do it with a snare. So from my perspective, uh, I use really three methods of dispatch. Um, I use a 22 more often than anything. Um, and depending on if I want to save the skull or not, that's a shot behind the shoulder or uh, in the head. Um, Either one is perfectly humane. Uh, I also use a dispatch pole on occasion with uh, bobcats specifically because of the way their anatomy is. Uh, they go unconscious extremely quickly from that uh, uh, that pole, you know, that cable tightening down. Um, and there are plenty of them designed that you just pull it tight and it locks or there's a ratcheting version that happens really quick. Um, those are pretty effective on bobcats specifically. I do not recommend gotcha. using them on anything else, but what they do serve is double duty if you're needing to release a non-target. You don't have to, you know, try to tighten it all the way down. You just get it enough where you can control the movement of that animal, and that allows you to get their foot out of the trap and release them no worse the wear. And then I use the, the uh, skunk pole on occasion that I mentioned earlier. Uh, can we talk about how much you can get for a fur, Jared? We can talk about it, but it'll be it'll change tomorrow. Um, the only thing that I can look at is just what happened last year and then the projections for this year. So last year, um, in state, so this is this is at our fur auction. Um, you know, we had 124 bobcats sold, and they averaged eighty nine dollars and forty cents a piece. So when you look at the last couple of years, that's that's a pretty good average. Um, going back to 2013 and 2014, um, that's the highest average that we've had for for a bobcat pelt. Um, coming in second from that would be a river otter at thirty-seven dollars and sixteen cents average. Um, and then beaver at thirteen dollars and seventy six average, and this is just for the pelt. You're not looking at at any of the additional byproducts that you get from that, be it the meat or the glands or the urine. Um, this is specifically pelts. So I, I said those three because those three are the only three that are predicted to to maintain or increase in value for this season: um, bobcat, beaver, and and river otter. Um, skunk is going to maintain probably just because it's probably the most stable fur price 
that we have in Oklahoma at eight dollars and fifty cents, um, everything else is going to go down. Um, you know, Coyote had a really good run for a couple of years based off of one uh, garment industry, uh, the Canada Canadian Goose or Canada Goose. Uh, they were making um, natural fur lined parkas, and that actually boosted the Coyote. Um, the coyote market, it, it was just incredible for three or four years. But then they went, they did a uh, um, synthetic only pledge and their stocks have, have gone way down since then. So that'll learn them. Um, but uh, there's there's a lot of forecasts that you can make on the on the fur market. But like I said, it'll change. It'll change by tomorrow. So as the, oh, there's a follow-up to that. Are your fur prices pelt only or full carcass? So as far as what I have on my tables, it is what goes across the, uh, it's an average of what goes across. And that can be full carcass, green skinned, or, or dried and put up. Um, those are the three ways that it goes across the table. I don't have them broken out in my tables, but the, the, um, the fur, uh, the Fur Bearers Alliance, they have theirs broken up, and I can I can look at that. Um, there are some species that that probably benefit you from putting across the table full carcass because you're going to get more money for it. Also, um, there's a, there are some people that are very specific about how they want something skinned and how they want it put up. Um, so when you're looking at bobcats, you're probably looking at being better off putting it across the table whole. Uh, if you're looking at beaver, you're probably looking at at uh, getting more money for a, for a full carcass beaver than you will be for a, for a put up beaver. Um, that's, and that's due to the secondary markets. And in the case of Bobcat, if they want them skint all the way down, including the claws for, for uh, certain reasons or mounts and that kind of stuff. So um, again, that's just something you would want to look at before you get ready to, to trap and kind of have those things in mind. But we might have missed one up there. There's, there's one question here about um, if any of us eat what we catch. I absolutely do. And, yes, um, absolutely. Well, for the most part. Yep. Well, there's certain things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Coyotes would be tough. Yeah. But Be uh, beaver and bobcat specifically delicious. for me, uh, I absolutely hate catching one that doesn't, that I don't. For whatever reason make it to the freezer with it mm -hmm. uh, they are really good uh it, it's surprising and especially the bobcat that surprises a lot of people but uh if you look into old records mountain men considered mountain lion to be a delicacy well a bobcat's just a smaller version of that uh it really is a, a good meat and i almost always pull the back straps out of those and beaver makes an incredible stew. Uh, I mean, I've done all kinds of stuff with it, and yeah, absolutely. And as far as what else you can do with the meats, like I said, a lot of times there's a, if you look around, you can find buyers that will buy the, the bobcat meat because of, you know, to go to bait making primarily. Also, uh, a lot of people will, in the past, I don't know about nowadays, but in the past, a lot of people would use the beaver meat to feed their hounds. That was a big, a big way that they supplemented their dog food bill. So there are other things if you're resourceful. So there was one up here I think we might have scanned over. So what is a what is a good means of legal disposal for a carcass? Um, as far as I'm concerned, any double bagging and putting it in the trash. As far as if you've if you've already cleaned off everything that you need from that carcass. Um, double bagging and putting it in the trash because every one of those landfills are going to be EPA lined or EPA lined landfills, and that's not going to have any problem. Or you can just bury it or burn it. Um, I think those are the those are the uh, accepted ways of disposal, right, Jacob? Yeah, yeah. If you have land and you got spots where you can bury it, burn it, that's great. But there is absolutely nothing wrong with running that through your trash service. Uh, I always tell people, you know, don't leave a bunch of feet and tails and stuff hanging out, but, you know, be respectful, bag it up, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, somebody asked how many cc's of acetone. Uh, yeah, that 10 cc, you know, get a get a big syringe, 
and uh, that's gonna that's gonna do it. Make sure to use don't don't take uh, the thing of acetone off the shelf. It's been there for five years. You know, get get good acetone every year uh, just to remove any you know uh, lack of efficacy with it. But uh, let's there's, see. A, there's a question about purchasing traps for coyotes other than online. And as mentioned, there are a couple of uh, retail of track specific retailers in the state. Um, there's a number of like pawn shops and stuff that will carry or in the past have carried trapping supplies. And also you can get at Cabela's and, and Bass Pro, you can get footholds that are worthy of a coyote. Um, yeah. you anything to add to that? I know they have them at Atwoods too, and most of Atwoods Atwood, yes. in Orshland. Probably Orshland. Most Atwood. your feed, feed stores and farm stores will normally have them as well. Lincoln County Farm Center actually has pretty good, pretty good <laughs> they, selection. They, they have a good selection. <laughs> One thing that you do have to be cautious of is a lot of times I've run into it that they're whatever they have, you know, at your local co op or something, they may not be offset or there may be something yeah. that, that is not uh, meeting the full definition of our legality. But what you can do, and I have done in the past, is take those that are not offset and you can uh, weld a little tiny spot uh, outside of the catch area of the jaws, but way over to the side where the levers are, uh, just a tiny little bump that will make it be an eighth of an inch gap. And you can basically make that offset yourself. You just have to make sure that it is not in any way on the jaws of the trap. It has to be off the sides where the levers are so that there would be no issue with it coming in contact with the animal. And then I uh, see when handling dog proof traps specifically for raccoon, do you have to wear gloves? I don't, uh, I don't think they care a bit. You know, I usually when I'm using dog proofs, I'm gonna bait those things with maybe marshmallows, Captain Crunch, you know, who, who knows? Anything sweet uh, is really gonna attract them. I've used cat food. Uh, sometimes I'll take like a, a fish oil or somewhere, something and kind of spread around, but they don't care about human scent. And there's enough of them that when three or four of them are running together, you're going to get one of them. That's, that's a really good point. The, uh, the biggies that are considered more sensitive to human scent are your coyotes and your foxes. And there's a wide range of opinion on that. For instance, we don't do a lot of scent control for our uh, canine trapping and it we're very successful or can be. Sometimes I'm not, but that's a different <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but if you talk to one trapper, they'll say you've got to wear rubber gloves, you've got to wear rubber boots, you've got, you know, kneeling pads. Um yeah. one thing about this with maybe trapping. that helps. It, it it I don't know. I think it's a lot of opinion. These critters know you've been there. The, the yeah. thing about all yeah, of I this, know. we could talk about how I set a trap, how I lure a trap, how I handle my equipment, and it's going to be totally different from the way the other guys here are doing that. Um, there's not necessarily a right way or a wrong way. There might be some things that work better than others, but you won't know until you figure it out yourself. And I can guarantee you, you know, we put on a couple of trapping workshops and we're going to do a few more. Uh, we usually have a couple of experienced trappers trying to help set traps and, and kind of talking about how we do things. We rarely agree on everything about a set, but I'm successful, JD's successful, you know, Jared's successful. We all do this different ways. We're all successful. Uh, and so what we're trying to give you here is just kind of the, the bare minimum and, and let you run with it because you may come up with something better than what we do or that works better. I mean, uh, there was a question about uh, do the fur auctions require frozen carcass? No, they'll they'll take them uh, however you bring them. Just remember that if if it <clears throat> if you have a nice cat that looks ugly, you're not going you're not going to get any money for it. But if you have a if you have a bad cat that looks nice, you'll probably get more money than you would for a for a good cat that looks bad. I was going to so, say part of the value of a bobcat is the belly, and if they've got a wider be white or belly and wider wide and more spots sometimes that's the that drives the value well if you if you take that cat for instance and you curl it up and throw it in the freezer that diminishes that the appearance of that 
more valuable part of the fur. Whereas if you stretch that cat out, which highlighted that part of the of the fur, then you know it's it's details like that mm. that can make a difference on on what you get at the buyer. So just things to think about. For years, I took green pelts to the fur auction, and if you take in a wet pelt that's bloody and and muddy and stuff, you're not going to make much on it. But I would go out the night before and I would thaw all my pelts and go over them with a hairdryer and a comb and kind of fluff that fur up and really kind of put a shine on everything. And I got on average more than people running, you know, just your kind of freshly unfrozen fur through. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of little tips and tricks that go along with some of that. But uh, like JD was saying with the Bobcats, they tend to take up a lot of space when you freeze them whole. Uh, so everybody wants to curl them in on themselves. But if you have the space, really, like he said, try to showcase that belly because that's where the money is on a on a bobcat pelt. There's a question here. When will we be putting on the trapping workshops? Um, as mentioned before, uh, it's going to be late January and early February. And I don't have those exact dates. You, you know how you enrolled for this class? Um on our outdoor calendar. They will be, they will be in the events on Go Outdoors. And if you're interested in these, you better sign up quick because they fill up. <laughs> Last year, they filled up within the, the, the Western workshop, I think, was maybe 30 minutes. The Eastern workshop was 15, 10, 15 minutes. It was full. Mm -hmm. So... We'll be getting that out there here in the next couple of weeks. We try to kind of start advertising that stuff right after deer season. Uh, but the first workshop that we'll be hosting will be January 20th and 21st. The second one will be February 3rd and 4th. And the last one will be February 10th and 11th. And these um, these signups will also have a waiting list. So if you get there and they're already full, um, the best I can tell the way they work is they kind of go to first come first served on the waiting list and we encourage people if they're signed up and can't make it as soon as they know they can't make it to go in there and unregister or have us unregister them and that allows the next person in line to bump up and uh, we've had what 60 ish percent yeah so we're going to bump those numbers up for each class a little bit in order to try to get you know, a full class. Um, it's only the third year, so we've kind of got things lined out now and they work well, so we're going to expand them just a little bit. We're adding the third class and we're bumping the numbers up a little bit too, so there'll be uh, more opportunity and hopefully moving forward that these will hopefully expand and uh, maybe more opportunity. Can you have someone video the workshops? Um, we do have we do have C and E, and they have committed to um, doing some coverage. Now, what they when I say C and E, I'm talking about our communication and education section. What they will do in way of coverage, I don't know. I don't know if they'll do some video or um, you know to do a TV show or a magazine article or just you know I don't know what their ideas will be, but they have committed to do some coverage. Yes. And the workshops, uh, the first one is going to be at Hula Wildlife Management okay. Area. I missed that up. Sorry. The second will be at James Collins, and the third at Pack Saddle. I the Pack Saddle was third and fourth. No, Pack Saddle is the last one. Let okay. me double check that. I believe. That's uh, why I didn't want to quote dates because yeah. no, I don't pa have pa Pack Saddle. <laughs> the Pack Saddle workshop is going to be February 10th and 11th. The James Collins workshop will be February 3rd and 4th, and the Hula will be January 20th and 21st. And I'll jump in there and answer one more question that hasn't been posted. Um, we've got the question quite a bit about, are we planning to do a water trapping, which would be your, your beaver, maybe mink, otter? Um, yes and no. Yes, we would like to do a water trapping because that's uh, there's there appears to be a lot of interest in that. It's a it's a totally different type of deal that would require its own class. You just can't cover everything in one. Um, but 
we're in a limited time frame. We've basically got what a month and a half uh, window where we're trying to do these uh, to fit into our schedules and still fit in with with uh, trapping schedule and that kind of stuff or trapping season. But in the future, we hope to get to that where you know maybe we do one in the yes. you know in the off season or something like that to cover some water trapping, but. Um, just wanted to throw that out there because we do get that question a lot and we hope to get there. We just, right now we're limited personnel and we all have full-time jobs. We're doing this additionally and it, uh, you know, we believe in it and we're committed to do them, but we've got to fit them in and it takes a lot of background work to get these done and going. So. Okay, I'm probably going to cap it here because we went 20 minutes over with so many awesome questions. And if you guys do continue to have questions, um, you hopefully you guys screenshotted or took the, that information from uh, JD and Colby's email address or phone numbers. And additionally, I could provide Jared's as well when I I'm do a follow up email. Them. <laughs> <laughs> Just bug them too. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, if if y'all have yeah. um, if y'all have specific Ferber questions. Jared's much more um, has a much better background to answer those questions. But if, if you know if you're wanting to know about trapping equipment or techniques or our opinions on any of that, reach yeah. out to Colby and I anytime. Or reach out to me, and yeah, then sure. I can field it to you to them too if you if it's easier that any, way. Any you now, like I said, we're always happy to. We would like to keep the trapping tradition going, and there seems to be quite an interest in it. So. Yep. Yep. Um, we're committed to to try to promote that as best we can. Okay. Yeah, so same I, goes for – go ahead. Same goes for me. If I can help you with anything, feel free. And, you know, your local warden, some of them might trap, some of them might not trap. So it's just kind of a – you know, you just got to ask them and talk to them. But if, if I can do anything for you, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I can talk about trapping all day long. So. Need subject to copper. So, okay. Well, I did want to mention one more time that this is recorded. And if you can give me about 24 hours notice or 24 hours before you jump onto our Outdoor Oklahoma YouTube page, um, it'll be under Learn to Hunt playlist. This will be completely um, from start to finish recorded, even the Q and A's and everything. And so you guys can go back and look at it. And then I will also send it back out. Uh, a link to it to this all the sign up or registrants too so just give me about 24 hours because it takes a very long time to get this especially over an hour recording uploaded and edited so I hope everybody enjoyed themselves today and got all their questions answered and thank you so much to all of our speakers that were able to come here today and put this on for us we know that there was clearly a need and a big interest in this which I was really happy and shocked to see um, the enrollment so I wanted to throw in there too if 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 this is something you guys are interested in and you want to see more of this stuff, you need to let us know. You need to let yes. Casey know uh, because the, the, the feedback we get is what goes up the chain. Mm -hmm. And we have had great uh, backing from our chain in this endeavor and the feedback is important and valuable. So not for us, but for the overall uh, continuation of this stuff, we appreciate it. Sure do. All right. Thank you guys. And hope you guys have a good rest of your week. That's a big yes. Awesome. Please more of this. Awesome. We can do that. <laughs> All right. I'm going to end it now. Thanks. Take care y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.